As Seyo said, I am a Greek American. My grandparents actually came from the nearby villages of Kapsia and Silimna, so it's very special for me to be here today, and I appreciate your patience in letting me speak English to you, and I'll try to go slowly. I want to talk to you today about how we can use information. One of the key things that defines us as living beings, as opposed to, say, a bunch of inanimate rocks, is our agency. That is, our ability to act on and react to our environment. We act in order to pursue opportunities for gain, and we act in order to avoid threats and harm. But to act effectively in our environment, we first have to understand that environment. And to understand it, we need to collect information. The primary way we collect information is with our senses. We can hear the world, we can smell the world, you can try to learn about the world by tasting it, and of course we can touch and feel the world. But there's one sense that dominates the rest of these. Our vision. Our vision uses 20 billion neurons across seven regions of the brain to process more information than all of our other senses combined. It is, in fact, the information superhighway between the world and our minds. And because of this significant role that it plays, it has evolved amazing capabilities, such that in the first 300 milliseconds of seeing an image like this one, your brain has already started to create a map of all the key properties of the image. Properties like how are things oriented or angled against each other, how near or far away are objects from each other, what shades of color are found across the image, and many more. And with that map, your brain starts to recognize patterns and extract meaning. Now, for our hunter-gatherer ancestors, being able to do this visual processing quickly was critical for survival. Because if you were foraging for food in the jungle, speed literally meant the difference between finding the food and being the food. Fast forward to modern times and things have changed significantly. Most of us don't forage for our own food anymore. Instead, we live in a much more complex world made up of a set of systems that we developed over time. Systems like agriculture and finance, industrialization and digitization. These systems have made our world and our problems much more abstract such that when we collect information today, it tends to look something like this, or like this. These numbers are fertility rates for countries around the world from the years 1950 to 2021. Fertility rate meaning the number of children born per woman in a society. Now, looking at this information, can you spot the threat to humanity here? Probably not. But what if we were to represent this information in such a way that we could apply our vision to it for understanding? Well, let's try starting with the visual property of orientation or angle. We'll take a single country, Greece, and we'll show her fertility rates as a set of angled lines. And when we do that, we can instantly see the story. The fertility rate in Greece is going down over time. Now, our brains are so good at seeing patterns like these that we're not limited to doing this for one country at a time. We can actually do it for... There you go. Know, 110 countries at the same time. And if you were to spend a few seconds quickly scanning that image, you would see the same pattern repeating over and over again. For the vast majority of countries, the fertility rate is going down. Now, is this a good thing, or is it a bad thing? Well, in order to answer that, we need something to compare it to. And we can use what's called the replacement rate. The replacement rate is the fertility rate that a society needs to replace itself from generation to generation. And in most advanced societies, it hovers around 2.1 children born per woman. So if we go back to our line for Greece, we can make this comparison with that 2.1 replacement rate easy, 
by using another visual property, proximity. We're very good at telling how near or far away things are from each other. So with that in mind, we'll draw our replacement rate as a dashed line, and we can immediately see more of the story. We can see exactly when Greece went below replacement rate in 1985, and we can see just how far below replacement rate Greece has gone. Now, to put these numbers into perspective, that last data point for 2021 is a fertility rate of 1.37. If that 1.37 were to hold for 30 years, Greece's population would go from 10 million to 7.5 million. So that's 2.5 million less Greek people walking around. So it's an important problem for Greece and for countries all around the world. But at this scale, it is hard for us. To see that replacement rate comparison, so let's help ourselves out and use another visual property: color. Let's highlight every time a country has gone below replacement rate with the color red. And when we do that, we can see the most important information. We can see immediately exactly which countries have gone below replacement rate. We can see when they've gone below replacement rate, and we can see just how far below replacement rate they've gone. Let's take this a step further, though, and see if we can figure out what might be contributing to this problem. We'll go back to that property of proximity, but this time, let's try grouping our countries together based on a common attribute, so we can look for a pattern. Let's try economic status. We'll start with a group of 20 low-income countries. Then we'll do lower-middle-income countries. Then upper-middle-income countries, and finally our high-income countries. When we do that, the pattern becomes obvious. The more advanced our societies and economies become, the worse our fertility rates get. And now we have somewhere to start digging into this problem. Let's recap what we did. We started with this information, which was abstract and indecipherable, and we turned it into a format. We turned it into a format where we could immediately apply our vision to it to understand it. We created a visual analysis. Unfortunately, analyzing our information isn't enough. Studies overwhelmingly show that we do not make decisions based on our rational minds. Instead, people make decisions based on emotion. So it's not enough for us to understand our information. We also have to be able to empathize with it. And visualization can help us there as well. The Democratic Republic of Congo, or the DRC, is a Central African country that has been besieged by political violence for several decades. In the 20-year period from 1997 to 2017, 51,000 people in the DRC lost their lives directly as a result of political violence. Now this number here, 51,000, is perhaps the most sterile way that we could summarize and represent that loss of life. And in fact, in 2017, the United Nations wanted to dive deeper into that number so they could understand how to best impact change in the region. So they held a hackathon where they invited data teams from around the world to come and build them tools for looking at this information. They wanted to understand where is this violence happening across the region, and who are the main players inflicting this violence. I led a data team in this hackathon, and when we dove into the data, what we found was complete chaos. This was not like a superhero movie where you get rid of a bad guy and then everything is okay. It was much more complicated than that. So what we did for the UN is we created an experience of the information, so that they could better empathize with the complexity. And that experience looks something like this. It is a playable timeline of the 20 years of violence as it unfolded from 1997 to 2017. And when I play this, what you are going to see on the map to the left, as we go from month to month and year to year of the conflict, bubbles will explode. Each bubble represents a violent event. The size of the bubble represents the number of lives lost. And the ones in red involve civilians. 
To the right of the map is a list of the most violent groups for any given year. And as we go from one year to the next, that list will resort itself that the most violent groups always go to the top. Let's watch starting with January 1997. into 1998, into 99, into 2000. What you can see on that map is we have massive violent events exploding consistently across time and location. And as for our list of most violent groups, as we go from one year to the next, you'll see the list completely reshuffle like a deck of cards being thrown in the air. Because as we remove one set of bad actors, a new set comes in to fill the void. As I said, a very complicated situation. And if you were to watch this timeline to the very end, you would be left with this final depiction of the 20 years of violence on this region. So what did we do here? Well, we used the visual properties of size and of motion and of color to condense 20 years of violence into a consumable two-minute experience so that the United Nations, when making decisions about this conflict, could do so with more empathy and humility. And empathy and humility is exactly what we're going to need if we want to tackle our modern challenges. Because we've come a long way from foraging in the woods for our food and running from four-legged predators. Our predators today are much bigger and complicated. We're dealing with global climate change. We're dealing with rising political violence. We're dealing with never-before-seen demographic shifts. If we're going to survive and indeed thrive in this world against these challenges, we're going to need to be able to analyze and empathize with our information so we can make the best decisions possible. And to make those decisions, we're going to have to trust our eyes. Thank you.